Welcome to the Solo Mo Show, a weekly podcast hosted by Corey O'Brien, the social media strategist at Heat and author of TheFutureOfAds.com. And I'm Adam Helway, CEO of the digital marketing agency Secret Sushi Creative. Each episode, we discuss topics, trends, tactics, and tools related to social, local, and mobile marketing and advertising. Our goal is to give you the information you need to be a better marketer. Today is Tuesday, February 5th, 2013, and this is episode number 55. In this episode, we're going to discuss the devices that top Pinterest users prefer, Super Bowl marketing and lessons you can learn from the big game, Facebook going after retail with the Facebook gift card, Instagram adding a web feed, Twitter putting a big focus on social TV, the new Foursquare for Business app, and much more. We always say much more, but you know, by the time I get to the much more, I'm like, do they really want that much more? I mean, we're always packing so much in there, right? <laughs> could there be more than that? Could there be? I mean, how could there possibly be more than that happening in one week since the last show? I uh, know. I like to throw it in there because we, we tend to add in a couple of side stories and anecdotes and things. So the end war just kind of is a nice blanket for that. So Adam, coming off the Super Bowl, were you as disappointed in the 49ers loss as I was, or were you more paying attention to the advertising and marketing that was going on around the game itself? I mean, although I I ended up watching the commercials, this is the first Super Bowl game in a decade or two, it feels like, that I've actually cared about since, you know, we're both from the Bay Area and you're either uh, uh, an Oakland fan or a San Francisco fan, usually. Uh, I've been a San Francisco fan since the 80s, but I, I honestly don't hadn't really cared about football for some time just because the Niners haven't been doing so great. And then suddenly everybody who plays a sport in the Bay Area is doing awesome. Well, at least the Giants and the Niners are. But the game was it was funny. My dad was being a hater just just because he saw that they were losing. And I was like, there's time. There's time. And he says, no, there, it's over. Game's over. And this was like before even halftime. So they were poking fun at me uh, because I was actually very much so rooting for the Niners. How about you? Yeah, it got, you know, for a while I was like, oh, man, this is just going to be ugly. And then, you know, you can't lose hope. You got to be like, all right, they're going to come out strong in the second half. And then, you know, there was that gigantic run back and it's like, oh, it's kind of over. And then the blackout happened and it's like, holy cow, this is just a whole nother thing now. And we're actually going to cover some of the fun brand reactions to that. I thought that was probably... Uh, my highlight of the game was as soon as the blackout happened, firing up Twitter and just seeing the crazy conversations that were going on. But before we get to Super Bowl marketing, which is coming as our main topic for the day, let's do a quick side trip to the land of Pinterest, because there was an interesting study that came out that kind of caught me by surprise. And so I thought we would share this as our data statistic of the week. So this was a study published on Pando Daily, who worked with Hello Society. Uh, apparently, Hello Society is a... Pando Daily and Hello Society. We're, uh, the names. You got to take two random words and smush them together. That's that's how you come up with a name nowadays. So Or three. Solo Mo Show, right? Very true. Very true. So <laughs> Hello Society, they call themselves a Pinterest agency. They basically focus on all things Pinterest. They'll help you put together a Pinterest marketing program. They'll do studies on Pinterest data. And one of the studies that they released recently was looking at Pinterest's most followed users and how those users actually prefer to post new content onto Pinterest. And it turns out that when you look at some of these most followed users, so basically anybody with 800,000 followers or more, um, which is, you know, a very sizable audience. These are people you see three, four, five hundred repins for basically every single thing that they post. They actually found that a majority of these top users are using a tablet. Some 58% of top Pinterest users post from their tablet, followed in second place by mobile with 30%, and then finally desktop notebook with a measly 12% of top Pinterest users preferred method i thought this was really interesting i would have you know thought these are the guys that are creating a lot of con content there's a lot writing on the pins from these top users they're going to be on their desktop really maybe it's editing photos or just making sure everything is the way that they want but it turns out a lot of these guys are using a tablet they're browsing content they're finding things they're sharing things all from the tablet environment what about you, Adam? Did this uh, kind of catch you off guard as well, or did this seem like uh, something you're like, yeah, you know, it only makes sense? 
Uh, I mean, I, I'm surprised just as it sounds like you are as well. I mean, you know, creating pins is not very easy to do if you are the originator of, of discovering content. If you're one of these tastemakers here that is actually the originator of these pins, uh, from your perusing around the web, it's, it's not easy at all to do from the web, uh, in comparison to doing it on a desktop browser, just like you were saying. And, um, even today was the first time I kind of dove, dove into Pinterest. Uh, I don't dive in as heavily, I think, even as you do. I think I see how, how often you end up pinning primarily because a lot of your stuff ends up getting shared back into Facebook. And so I can see how often you're doing that. But I've seen a change in the user interface, for instance, on Pinterest, little subtle things that they've been doing uh, that would not translate well over to a tablet. Um, and so that's what really surprises me. And I, I'm, I'm going to have to dive back in and check out Pinterest tablet uh, version, their iPad app, to see if, if they've made some pretty significant updates there as well to make it easier for folks to, to have uh, a very similar experience on the tablet that they do on the web. Yeah, and I think the main takeaway for this, and this is one of those things that's kind of interesting where s little bits of data that you're grabbing here and there start to come together. So the takeaway to learn from this, learning that 58% of top Pinterest users are pinning via the tablet, is to make sure your site works well on a tablet environment. So, you know, it's a pretty easy thing to do. Grab an iPad or a, you know, a larger size Android tablet. If you don't have one, you know, take a little side trip to the Apple store, borrow theirs for a little bit. Uh, but load up your website and make sure it's functional and usable inside of a tablet. Uh, and then I would say step two is, you know, if you're the type of site that's really going after that Pinterest audience, make sure you've got a pin it button right there on your site. So it's one thing to copy a URL, open up the Pinterest application, go through that whole process. That, you know, is doable. But I'm guessing that a lot of the people using tablets want to just see that pin it button, tap right there, have it pop up with a good image, a good little bit of copy. Maybe they can customize it a little bit if they want to. But really optimize your site for tablet usage because that is the direction that a lot of these influential Pinterest users are going. And, you know, that's the type of person that you want to cater to if, you know, a single pin or a couple of pins from these people could realistically result in a decent number of sales. I would say it's probably worth the time to just make sure, hey, does my site load? Can I click the buttons that I think I should be able to click? And, you know, is is the experience something that's workable or does the site basically break when I try to load it up on a tablet? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. And I mean, I, I think beyond just looking at beyond just looking at your own site, I mean, I, I'd say pick up the tablet and actually test out Pinterest itself and see what the experience feels like and familiarize yourself with it a bit. But, but again, I, I was really surprised by those numbers. Um, and I'm going to have to give the iPad app another try since I, I really rely primarily on the desktop myself for uh, what I believe is, is kind of considered the true Pinterest experience, but the data tells a little bit otherwise. All right. So with that, let's dive into our main topic of the day, which is Super Bowl marketing. No, no, no. The big game. The big game. We don't want to have any lawsuits or anything like that. The big game marketing brought to you by something that rhymes with Uber Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, Superb Owl. Did you see that in the last moment? Everybody was uh, uh, that was a trending topic on Twitter just before the Super Bowl was Superb Owl. Superb I don't know why owl. Nice. you just move the letters a little bit and it turns the Super Bowl into Superb Owl. So who in your mind was the winner of the Marketing Bowl 2013? I mean, I think it was Oreo. I think it was Oreo, and, and I think we'll get into why, but I mean, I'll just say that. It, I think it was Oreo. I second that. I think Oreo killed it. I think what's interesting is, so for those of you that haven't seen it, we'll include a link to this in the show notes. Right after halftime, the game was going, you know, everything was kind of progressing along as usual, and suddenly the power in the Superdome went out. The stadium where they were hosting the Super Bowl, the power goes out, Three quarters of the lights go dark, the game's called off, there's basically a 30 minute pause in the action while they try to figure out what's going on with the power. And while this is happening, you know, they can't just cut to commercial break because these commercials are such high value that they have everything slotted into very specific times and people are buying, you know, I want to be on the first commercial break of the third quarter. And so they have a couple of advertisers that they can slot in and say, okay, if we have an extra 
opportunity? Do you want to buy another ad at, you know, a discounted price or whatever? But they don't have 30 minutes of advertising just queued up and ready to go. And so what they have to do is get all of their spokespeople on TV to just sort of stall. And the conversation, you know, they try to keep it related to the game and they try to keep it going, but it's pretty boring on TV. So a lot of people turn to social media. And, of course, with something like a blackout on a nationally televised game, there's a lot of people cracking jokes and making fun of the situation. Well, Oreo decided to get involved in this conversation and really quickly put together a image that just had a, si- a simple little Oreo, and it was kind of haloed in this white light against a, a dark background, and it says, you can still dunk in the dark. Uh, And they tweeted out, it said, power out, no problem, and then just a link to this picture. Well, because it was so relevant to the conversation, it got more than 15,000 retweets and 20,000 Facebook likes, including one for myself. I saw this thing and I was cracking up. I was like showing everybody in the room. Everybody else was cracking up at it. Uh, You know, I retweeted it to my followers. People actually saw that and commented later to me uh, about, you know, I saw that Oreo ad. Wasn't that funny? I think... You know, great example of not spending the big dollars. Oreo did have an ad in the Super Bowl. They also spent big dollars. But being able to capitalize on an opportunity and being the fastest or the, you know, most clever of the group of fast brands to respond in order to capitalize on a lot of that conversation uh, and really, you know, not being afraid to post something and say, all right, let's throw something out there. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. I think that Oreo uh, kind of set the bar pretty high for what we're going to consider real-time marketing moving forward. Yeah, I mean, and and I, my reasoning for saying that they were the winners is primarily because of their earned media around this whole thing, right? It was like you could you, you saw it, and you might have seen it like you were saying you and I were on Twitter, I was on Facebook, both places just kind of checking out uh, all the crying fans of the Niners as the game was going on. But then when the, the Oreo deal popped up, it, it, it was, it's, it's still part of the discussion a couple days later here, you know, we've got Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, the, the, the people are still talking about it. And it, it is out of all the other examples that we have, it's still considered kind of like the shining example of, of this kind of real time advertising, jumping on an opportunity do, during this event to go ahead and put something out there. There were a number of articles that featured strictly the Oreo ad and people were saying, well, how did they do it? How did they respond to it? You know, I mean, quite honestly, the image is quite simple. Um, but, but I think, and I think we can get to it in a little bit about how others might take advantage of this sort of thing, this sort of thing. But, uh, uh, I mean, I think that really is is where the uh, the points are scored in this particular ad is is that it got people talking not just because it was an ad. If this was done at any other time, if it was posted at any time, like many of their other ads are when they post their um, you know kind of themed images that they've been doing recently that we've talked about in previous episodes, like the moon landing and all those sorts of things. It, it might get a little visibility, but in comparison to this, because of the timing of it, it made a huge difference. Yeah, and I think you nailed it. It's not, you know, this crazy ad with a lot of art direction and all sorts of things going into it. It's a single line of copy and half an Oreo against a, you know, gradient background that anybody with five minutes of Photoshop training could do. So it's not the content of the ad. It was the timeliness and it was the you know, quick wit and the ability to get involved in the conversation. This is one of those things that had they waited 20 minutes, this thing would have flatlined. They would have had, you know, a couple of chuckles, but nowhere near 15,000 retweets because a lot of people did exactly what I did. They saw the blackout, they fired up Insta or they fired up Twitter and they just were reading through some of the comments. And if you see Oreo in that stream, you're going to read it. If you see him 20 minutes later trying to, you know, grab onto the tail end of the story and say, oh, don't forget about us, you, you're more likely to skip over it. So I think timeliness was key here. And, um, you know, you mentioned the daily Oreo thing that they were doing a while back where they were literally creating one of these types of images every single day. I think that that was actually key. That was sort of them practicing and warming up and working out their process for how do we create something clever and interesting and retweetable and shareable, but do it in a way that we can do it repeatedly, we can do it quickly. 
you know, we we know who needs to approve it. We can put all those people in a single room so that when the Super Bowl rolls around, we just look around the room and go thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. OK, we're posting it. You don't need, you know, a, a huge process of emailing it around and getting signatures and that sort of thing. So I think that Oreo really, you know, it, it it's not a fluke. They practiced for this. They put a process in place and they were ready so that when the opportunity arose, they could take advantage of it. It wasn't just that they got lucky. I think that they, you know, were prepared and that preparedness paid off uh, when the opportunity did present itself. The other one that I loved was Audi. Audi not only made something clever, they took a little shot at a competitor, which I thought was kind of ballsy because they did it in a in a sort of a way that you can't really retort to. So uh, Mercedes Benz actually sponsors the Superdome, and so in a lot of the shots of the Super Bowl, you'd see this giant Mercedes Benz logo. And so Mercedes obviously has no control over the power, but when the power goes out in a stadium that they're sponsoring, all of their rivals have the opportunity at least to take a, a quick little jab at them. So Audi tweeted out, sending some LEDs to the at MBUSA Superdome right now, dot, dot, dot. Uh, LEDs being their, their very distinctive headlights that they're known for. You know, even their ads kind of promote LEDs. And last year they had the LEDs overcoming vampires. So it was an opportunity for them to, you know, take a nice little shot at Mercedes-Benz. And a lot of people appreciated that kind of quirky humor with uh, over 9,600 ret- retweets. So... A couple of great examples of brands that weren't afraid to, uh, you know, put something out there, become a part of that conversation, and really utilize Twitter in a way that's uh, that worked well for them. And uh, you know, the difference right there, right, is that, like, for instance, I saw that I didn't really get it. I understood they were talking about LEDs and lights. I didn't know what MBUSA stood for, and so you know, your, your backstory there, providing some context me to understand that better so i think those that might uh have known because i saw um, the reaction that people had on on twitter to that particular tweet was was you know uh, as if they got it they understood what was going on so maybe i was the only one besides the superdome that was in the dark in that sense but it was there was no image involved right it was just the tweet so it wasn't even that they had to put creative juices into creating some sort of image or a video or something like that but let's let's talk about the other ones that are on this list. Just a few of them that you know kind of stand out. Um, you know, there was the Volkswagen one, which actually just took advantage of it to recycle the ad that they had already played that was actually also on YouTube. So they basically just did another tweet: lost power during the game. Dot dot dot. Don't worry, get happy. And then they had you know, and they, they didn't even have the hashtag for the Super Bowl in this, to be honest. And, and that's likely why they only had 162 retweets and 23 favorites. Well, also if you look at it, so Oreos was posted at 1:48, uh, and that was six minutes after the lights had gone out. Uh, the Volkswagen one was posted at 1:53. So even five minutes later, you know, they really just didn't have the same kind of response and you could even tack that up to you know size of the audience that they had built up so Volkswagen actually has 93,000 followers Oreo only has 70,000 followers and a lot of those followers came as a result of the tweet that they made so it goes to show that you know Oreo managed to walk that line of being clever and being something that people felt was a natural part of the conversation while Volkswagen tried a little too hard in my mind to integrate their marketing and force the hashtag down people's throats and say, oh, you know, watch our commercial again. And when really everybody just wanted to, you know, throw clever, funny comments about the blackout around, they didn't want to engage yet again with an ad that they had only they had already seen 30 minutes prior. And, and if you take a look at a lot of the other companies here or, or even organizations, uh, you, you know, there really isn't a lot of relevance when it comes to either football or when it comes to lights. I mean, I think the, the Audi one was the closest to anything having to do with lights because, like you said, their signature headlamps. But they've got, uh, for instance, one from One Campaign, which is a, a nonprofit movement uh, to fight against poverty. And there said half a billion people in Africa never, and this is all capitalized, never have power. Learn more. And then they have a link to their uh, page to learn more. Uh, PBS, this might be a good time to think about alternative programming. Uh, we have, and they have a hashtag, Super Bowl Blackout hashtag. Uh, we, we have Downton Abbey. Um, and so, you know, they, they, the, I'd say probably the, the most unusual or, or kind of surprising standout 
um, is the Calvin Klein one that ended up leveraging Vine, the, the video app that we discussed, uh, I think it was last episode or the episode before that, um, where you get six seconds of video and they basically just posted six second. It looked like of one of their male models exercising in Calvin Klein underwear or something like that. Yeah. Well, the Calvin Klein one is interesting because they actually, so that one specifically, you know, eh, the saying, the thing that they were writing didn't line up with the images, images that they were sharing, but they actually had an entire vine based campaign that they ran during the Super Bowl, which I thought was really interesting because you know, Calvin Klein up until this point wasn't really somebody that I thought of as like an innovator in the marketing world, but nobody else used Vine and used the opportunity to promote Vine the way that Calvin Klein did. So Calvin Klein throughout the game posted, I think it was, you know, 10 or more little six second clips of one of their male models. It it was definitely targeted towards a female audience. It's basically a, you know, a guy in his briefs and he's doing sit-ups and showing off his six-pack abs and doing that whole thing. Uh, And so the one that they showed during the blackout, it just said, since the lights are still out, and it's got, you know, this guy doing crunches, and maybe, you know, the the audience is a little interesting for that one, but it did get 261 retweets, it got 114 favorites, and it really showed Calvin Klein as being an innovator in the digital marketing space for... Not just making one vine, but making ten and and integrating themselves into the conversation, and you know, again, kind of testing and learning with Vine. I think the way that we saw Oreo test and learn with some of these quick hit images, and then when the opportunity presented itself, really, you know, hit it out of the park. I think this is Calvin Klein saying, "Okay, let's learn some lessons for how to actually use Vine in a real time manner," and then. The next time something happens that could be accented with Vine, all these other brands are going to be playing catch up while Calvin Klein is going to have a lot of experience to draw on and say, "Okay, we know what works. We know how to make these things social and shareable. Let's just repeat that formula. So I thought that was interesting to see their team come up with. So now we've talked about those, you know, let's kind of close things out and, and, and kind of share with folks some tips on how they might think about making something like this happen, because really anybody, it doesn't have to be a big brand. Anybody could have taken advantage of this sort of thing, right? And in looking at, for instance, Oreo, they've talked a lot with with folks uh, since that ad kind of, like I said, had gained so much media attention. And for them, they said really the key was that they were there and they were prepared. They actually had both their ad agency team and some folks directly from Oreo, from the the client uh, themselves, they're ready to react to things. And um, I wasn't as familiar with some of the other things that they may have been doing beyond this sort of uh, this particular ad itself. Uh, So I don't know if they were just waiting for the right moment, if they were all sitting around watching the game or or what, maybe it was likely because that ad, that agency had helped out with the actual television spot that they had as well during the Super Bowl, but they were they were sitting around and they were prepared to kind of brainstorm and make a decision very very quickly. It wasn't uh, you know, in some some shape or form the creative folks involved have to be given a thumbs up, right? And so either they're given free reign to do whatever they want on behalf of the brand, or you have to come together during that event during that real time. Uh, event in order to you know come up with something and put it out there very very quickly and like I said Cord you I mean do you agree that pretty much any brand it could have been the smallest of brands for instance could have really found a way to take advantage of that to gain some um, some reach on the social web but also potentially some media uh, some earned media from it as well I definitely agree with that and I think part of that just goes again to the idea that Oreo didn't have it's not like they had millions of followers on their Twitter account. And so, of course, they send this funny thing and it's going to get retweeted thousands of times. They only had, you know, they added more than 10,000 followers just during the game. So they had less than 60,000 followers at the time that they posted that and just got this huge response because it was timely. It was posted during the peak of when people were talking about the power outage. It wasn't, you know, 20 minutes later. It wasn't 30 minutes later. I think that this is one of those scenarios where speed is one of, if not the most important factors of becoming an active part of the conversation. Even five minutes later, I think, is a huge decrease in potential reach and potential virality. So you have to have that process in place. You have to have all of these stakeholders together and ready and able to say, all right, let's, you know, there it is. That's our moment. Let's capitalize on that, make what we need to make, get it approved and get it out there. 
Uh, and you also have to be willing to, you know, not have everything be a huge success. That that could have easily gone out, gotten a few hundred people to say, oh, that's kind of funny. But you can't get down on that. You have to just keep going and you have to say, all right, well, that one, you know, worked OK. How do we make the next one better? How do we keep improving? Uh, because I think especially with real time marketing and real time conversation, you're not going to have 100 percent success. You're going to have some that kind of you know, go out there and and could be considered duds. But at the same time, if you don't keep trying and you don't keep pushing, you're never going to have those huge successes. So I think that, you know, Oreo has really mastered the idea of create a lot of content and create it quickly and be willing to have some not work because eventually some are going to work and you're going to see the results of that. And I think that they kind of had that big win moment during the Super Bowl. Another quick thing to remember as we close this segment out is that Twitter has you know, their, their basis, their, their whole advertising platform, or, or at least a, a good chunk of it when it comes to promoted tweets is all about real time marketing, right? It's, it's about uh, taking advantage of timing. And, uh, and as we've discussed in previous shows about being able to react to things very, very quickly to then suddenly create an ad 140 characters and put it up there, which is quite different uh than having to come up with a broader advertising campaign or creating um, actual images or videos or something like that to accompany your advertising. You, you don't even have to do that. It could just be a 140 character tweet that happens to be always at the top of a particular feed uh, when people are searching. And although this, although any of these brands could have taken advantage of that, and I don't actually remember who it was that did take advantage of that uh, at that time, because uh, somebody obviously had to have stepped up and paid the money to do that on Twitter during the game. Uh, but the these guys themselves actually circumvented that by coming up with something clever uh, and, and and their timing made, made a big difference. So for smaller businesses, uh, a currently a Twitter promoted tweet is going to be hard because of the price for it. As far as I know, it's in the you know, tens of thousands of dollars um, in, in regards to what the budget would be that you'd have to have ready to go for a campaign like that uh, with Twitter, but it's free to do what most of these guys did. I don't think any of these guys spent money on Twitter. I mean, it's obviously not free to have your ad agency or your creative folks together, putting this stuff together and, and getting it out there uh, on time. Um, but to put the creative and, and extend the reach, you either get it organically or you pay for it. Right. And everybody did it here organically. Yeah. And Twitter actually said the first sponsored, uh, I'm sorry, the first promoted tweet to appear against searches for power outage happened just four minutes after the power went out. So there were brands that were, they were looking for those words. Uh, it's kind of, you know, I think Google AdSense buying used to be like this back in the day where there were certain phrases where if you could get in there quickly, you'd get a little bit of a discount on what the price would eventually settle out at. You would get a majority of those searches. And, you know, I think we're going to... They said that uh, during the actual power outage, I think they saw peaks of over 200,000 tweets per... Is it second or minute? Let's see. Tweets per it minute. It has to be a minute. Yeah. yeah. 231,000 tweets per minute. So a ton of people tweeting about the power outage. And, you know, again, the difference between four minutes being able to serve your ads against those and waiting 10 minutes could be millions of tweets that could show up against your promoted content. So uh, I think that we're going to see a lot more brands put more focus on these real time moments, especially around events where, you know, there's going to be opportunities such as the Super Bowl, such as presidential inaugurations, that sort of thing, where. Uh, there's sort of expected crowds and it's expected action around a couple of big topics. And and I think to repeat stuff that you've said in the past, right? We want we we suggest putting together an annual events calendar of things that are all around big and things that are big in relationship to maybe your industry and your brand, and then start brainstorming how you could take advantage of those things uh, in real time. And amongst all the networks that you're participating in, all the channels, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Plus, whatever, whatever tickles your fancy, maybe even Pinterest. But uh, yeah, really cool stuff. Uh, I think this definitely was a, a, a different sort of um, this was a different sort of thing that we that we've seen in regards to the Super Bowl um, related to social media. I think there's definitely a, an evolution that's happened year over year. And it, uh, the blackout added some 
some spice to that uh, that time that the game the big game. All right, well, we have a extended lightning round. Last couple of episodes we've had a shortened lightning round, so we're going to make up for it this episode with an extended lightning round, which should be fun. We've got five stories in the queue. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and put 60 seconds on the clock and dive right into the first one so that we can make sure that we hit a majority of these. All right, 60 seconds on the clock, Adam. Ready and go. So the first story is retailers struggling with Pinterest. And don't let the article title fool you. It's it's basically saying uh, retailers are having trouble with Pinterest because a lot of times retailers change their stock or they change the layout of their website and it's deleting old URLs, but it doesn't mean that that is suddenly gone from the Pinterest system. So there's a lot of popular pins inside of Pinterest that have been kind of shared around for quite a while now. And so the thing that it points to actually no longer exists in that store. And what they're looking at is, you know, what does a brand do when that situation arises? When somebody clicks on something and they land on a page that just says, oops, there's nothing here. Uh, I actually had that happen to myself. I was looking at this really cool lamp. I was like, oh, I'm kind of ready to buy this thing. Like, let's find out where I need to go. I click on the image of the lamp and there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to give my money to. So, Adam, as the timer buzzes, What's your take on this? What do you think retailers should do when suddenly Pinterest is pointing people to areas of their website that no longer exist? Ready and go. So they talked about a few vendors that are out there that are trying to solve the problem and do other things uh, like, for instance, create ways of offering offers and ads to folks that might end up landing on a page where something doesn't exist. I mean, I think it's an it's a website infrastructure thing when you uh, when you should have processes to allow you to, well, you should have processes to make sure that you review when something goes out of stock or whatever. Uh, I, I think it can be easily solved if you if you take a look at your site and you see, do you need to install some sort of redirects so that if there's a dead page that it automatically gets redirected to something else or that every single 404 page or, or, or item out of stock page has some way of uh, looping somebody back through. I, I don't think it's a huge deal. I think it's a new issue that people are running into and they're just going to have to figure out how to solve it. But there are a lot of ways to solve it if they just brainstorm a little bit and talk with their webmaster or IT guy. Yeah, I think just just leave it on your site. Just put that it's no longer available. But hey, thanks for coming from Pinterest and check out all the other cool stuff that we have for sale. All right, 60 seconds back on the clock for story number two. Ready and go. This is kind of a follow-up and also kind of a sneak preview because it's a feature that's not technically live yet. But TechCrunch got a little sneak peek at some changes that Facebook is testing to their status update box. So right now the status update box is just a giant text box. You can put whatever you want into it. Uh, But what they're testing is the ability to, when you click on it, do very specific types of status updates. So watching, reading, listening to, drinking, and eating. Uh, And so you could do something like, I'm watching the Super Bowl. I'm listening to... Nick Warren, I'm drinking hot chocolate. Now, it seems like a small change, but what is this going to do? This is going to start to fill out their social graph and make a lot of these connections for things that people might want to search for inside of graph search. I think this is potentially huge for them, and this kind of answers that question of, okay, graph search is great, but how do they actually get a lot of that type of data into it? Uh, It seems like this is their plan. All right, Adam, 60 seconds on the clock. Do you think this is going to help them out, or do you think this is asking users to do too much? Ready and go. Uh, I'll be honest. I've actually thought of this as something interesting oh, probably a couple of years ago. Uh, that Well, in regards to the emotional stuff that they're kind of uh, referring to in this, um, the whole... I'm reading a book or I'm watching this is, is something that get glue for instance is doing right. And, and, and get glue. I'm actually a big fan of get glue and I use it 99.9% of the time for watching TV uh, or, you know, checking in that I'm watching a particular show or checking in that I'm watching a particular movie. I, I think that's probably the same case for most people. You could also say I'm playing a video game or I'm reading a book or, or whatever. Um, so I actually don't think this is too far fetched. Um, I think the feeling part is something that people haven't really um, tackled well. And if you add it to Facebook, the pure scale of the Facebook users 
uh, could really um, take this on and use it. All right. So sticking with the Facebook news for just a second, let's dive into story number three. Ready and go. So this is an actual product that Facebook is launching. We are out of the pretend and into the real. They are launching something called the Facebook card. And when I first saw this thing, I was like, holy crap, Facebook's doing a credit card. But it is not. It is a... (laughs) Fancy schmancy gift card, and it's basically designed to integrate into their Facebook gifts system and become a swipeable uh, interface for a gift that you would give somebody through Facebook. So now let's say I gave somebody $10 to Target. That $10 gets loaded up onto this card, and they can swipe that in Target to buy $10 worth of stuff. But the same card is going to work for a variety of vendors. It's basically... You know, all the big companies that are working with Facebook gifts are going to be available on this card. Facebook is sending it out to everybody that gets a gift card as a way of just distributing this card. So that's definitely going to get it out there into the market. It'll be interesting to see if people actually use this thing, though, or if the benefits are not worth the cost. All right, Adam, 60 seconds. What's your take on the Facebook card? Interesting or a flash in the pan? Ready and go. Uh, I think it's a flash in the pan. Uh, I think anything that they that they've kind of released so far that's been Facebook branded that's been available in the stores like the Facebook credits and all those sorts of things haven't really taken off. Uh, I mean, a lot of them were, were to be used for things like the games that are online. And I honestly haven't done a lot of research into that side. So I don't know if it's been that uh, popular, but it seems like anything that's just been branded, like in the real world that you can take that has Facebook just isn't popular Facebook's gifts are, I think, are awesome, but kind of trying to translate this into this card. I don't know. I don't. I don't necessarily see it as 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 flying, and I don't think that it's something that marketers need to necessarily be concerned with. But hey, experiment a little, try it out, see if anything happens. All right, with five seconds left, I will add that I think there's room for improvement, and if they make some uh, some minor changes, things like loyalty programs, it could be interesting. But I agree with you that in its current state, meh, not really that interesting. All right. 60 seconds on the clock for story number four. Ready and go. This one, a long time coming, and now it's official. Instagram is available on the web. Uh, They recently made the addition where you could view someone's Instagram photo and actually follow that account, but you couldn't interact with it the way that you could inside of the Instagram mobile site. Uh, But now if you just go to Instagram.com, it works much like Twitter, much like uh, Facebook. It's got a little feed of all of your recent photos, and you can like and comment on those photos right from that feed. It's basically a full-featured Instagram web interface. One of the things that I thought is interesting is it makes the photos bigger. So a lot of times you see photos on Instagram's mobile app, and they're, they're smaller, and they look really cool. And when I first loaded this thing up, I was like, oh, these are big and they don't necessarily look as good in like big mode. So I think that'll be kind of interesting to pay attention to. But, uh, you know, I want to I want to talk about it and maybe get your take on if you think this is going to hurt them moving away from mobile only or if you just think this is a logical uh, evolution of the service. So what's your take on it? 60 seconds. Ready and go. I think what, what I think is interesting about this is the, the whole discussion of mobile first, mobile first, mobile first, and how, you know, because the future is mobile that, you know, creating things on mobile and, and it, for some reason, keeping them on mobile and in, in, in regards to smartphone and tablet is the, is the, only way to go or a pure way to go or whatever the case may be. But we're seeing that a lot of these guys are moving. We're talking food spotting, Foursquare as well, are actually moving to the web. They're, they're taking it and they're building out something that's appropriate for people using full-size browsers on a, on a web, uh, on a, on a full-size web browsers on a desktop or a laptop computer. I don't think it's going to hurt them. It could increase the level of engagement that people have. Uh, I think most people still who are really passionate about uh, Instagram are going to be using it on their mobile devices, but maybe it'll uh, it'll kind of attract some new users to uh, the platform. One story left in the lightning round. Ready and go. So the last story we're going to cover today is Twitter buying a company called Bluefin Labs. Bluefin Labs calls themselves a leading social TV analytics company. And I would agree with that statement. I've been following Bluefin Labs' blog for quite a while, and they put out a lot of great data. They basically look at 
How do people interact with social media when they're watching TV? Do people actually pay attention to hashtags, that sort of thing? So Twitter saw that and said, hey, we're putting a lot of focus on TV and mainstream media. Let's acquire this company, make our analytics better, provide this data to our advertisers. I thought this was a very smart move on Twitter's behalf. Uh, Not necessarily surprising. I would say it's almost surprising that Bluefin Labs remained independent for as long as it did. Uh, I think this shows that Twitter really is putting their focus on mainstream media. They they want to go after the big advertising buys, the big dollar budgets, uh, and this is just the next step in that evolution of the company. All right, Adam, 60 seconds on the clock. What's your take on their acquisition? Ready and go. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, you've shown a lot of – we've done a lot of discussions around data um, – in the second screen area, we've done a whole show on it the long time ago as well. Uh, and they've, they've creeped up a lot of times in those discussions. I think it's just so interesting that this social TV element happens to be something that I think really kind of evolved on its own. There was the, the intention, be- there was no intention behind it when it came to any of the vendors that happened to really take advantage of this, especially Twitter. I think Twitter had no idea that it would become sort of this companion to what people are doing when they watch TV and all the Super Bowl stuff that we talked about proves uh, that this is a, a good acquisition of, of talent and acquisition of technology. Um, and that, uh, you know, they've kind of claimed a stake in the ground of what they believe is going to be at least one pillar in their business uh, as far as Twitter is concerned. Right at the buzzer. All right, well done, well done. I actually wanted to bring up one quick thing that we didn't get a chance to cover during the Super Bowl stuff, but since it relates to Twitter and social TV, uh, I can slot it in here right at the end. So the debate is a lot of people were saying Twitter was featured in more than half of Super Bowl commercials, but in actuality, if you look at it, hashtags were featured in more than half of Super Bowl commercials, and Twitter itself was actually not featured in that many. Uh, A lot of brands said, you know, hey, here's our hashtag. If you want to talk about us or our campaign, use this. And people were sort of crediting that to Twitter. But at the same time, you know, Instagram supports hashtag. Google Plus supports hashtags. Do you think Twitter is sort of owning the hashtag? Or do you think that brands are, you know, maybe smarter than the media in this case? And they were just saying, hey, if you want to talk about us, throw this hashtag in wherever that conversation happens to be. You know, Twitter, great, but also, you know, we're hedging our bets and saying, hey, make sure to hashtag us and Instagram and that sort of thing. Uh, Or do you think, you know, Twitter at this point owns the hashtag and anytime a brand promotes a hashtag, it's mainly to get people to sort of tag that conversation inside of Twitter? A hashtag is kind of the most open and flexible way of participating in the conversation, right? Versus completely mentioning a, a an actual Twitter account specifically. And so in some cases, uh, that's great. And in other cases, it, it doesn't mean that just because you end up counting the volume of tweets around something, a particular hashtag, that every single one is 100%, uh, I, I guess you'd say, in relationship to your campaign. Because, you know, there's a lot of people that don't know why the hashtag is even there and might use it. There's others that are actually using it in jest and kind of joking around when they use it or even talking bad about the brand. But it, it's the most flexible thing, uh, I think, that people can offer up on Twitter in regards to their brand or a particular campaign. Um, and it's also flexible in the sense that you could do multiple campaigns per brand and use multiple hashtags to have those. I kind of see that as far as it goes and, and to, to try to get somebody to follow a Twitter account just doesn't make sense. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, what do they call it? It's a hard conversion and a soft conversion, right? You want to offer something that, that is kind of ultimately what you really want them to do, but that might be a little bit too much risk, too much effort. You're asking them to do that would be a hard conversion, like following me on Twitter. But then there's the soft conversion, which is, ah, but at least have a discussion about this, this campaign or about this particular, uh, commercial and use our hashtag that's easy low risk i'm not committed to following you for the rest of my life on twitter that sort of thing that's how i see it yeah i think it might be kind of a unique result of the super bowl and brands sort of saying there's going to be a lot of conversation about our ads specifically and if you're going to talk about it use this hashtag so that you know you can tell your friends easily which ad you're talking about 
But I did think it was interesting that there weren't a lot of call to actions inside of the spot that said, you know, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Here it is, you know, sign up to our outgoing messaging. It was more saying we want to be part of that conversation. Uh, and again, Oreo, you know, dominated that. They they literally became part of the conversation by saying, hey, here's an image that you can talk about and share with your friends. But it seems like there's a shift towards, you know, integrating and, and becoming part of that conversation and away from, you know, the number one request being follow us, follow us, follow us. So it'll be something interesting to pay attention to and see if that trend continues or if, you know, like I said, it's just a kind of local trend to the Super Bowl and brands go back to promoting their main outbound accounts where they can get a lot of that outward messaging uh, and, you know, not worry as much about becoming part of the ongoing conversation. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we got one more topic for today, and that is a quick look at the Foursquare for Business app that came out recently. And this is going to be our action item for the week because if you've got a Foursquare business, a uh, basically any brick-and-mortar retail space that people check into, this seems like a must-download, a must-use, a must-add to your iOS device. So, Adam, did you get a chance to check out the Foursquare for Business app? And if so, what did you think of it? Uh, you know, I wanted to look at it in a bit more detail because I wanted to see exactly what differentiated it between utilizing anything that's already available by Foursquare. I think the thing that I would say that it's probably most akin to is the Facebook Pages app that is out there that allows you to manage things more from a brand perspective um, on Facebook. So rather than having to deal with things uh, from a user's perspective, they're providing something that allows folks, obviously, uh, as, the, as the description has it that Corey was mentioning, to manage from a brand's perspective and that brand manager or the multiple brand managers who are are, are, are are supporting that brand on on Foursquare don't have to use their personal account, for instance, to go ahead and manage it. I, I think we're going to see more of these coming out. I think currently there's a lot of these apps, like for instance, even Twitter, that you use from Twitter's perspective, and you have to be a Twitter user to use it. But I think there, you know, we'll probably see in the future a Twitter application, a mobile application on Twitter that is primarily for those that are actually managing things like advertising and metrics and and those sorts of things. So. Uh, that's where I really saw this this Foursquare app fitting in. Yeah, and a quick rundown of the features. So you can create a Foursquare update, which I don't see a lot of brands doing, but apparently, you know, you can say, hey, come check out our chicken wing special today, two for the price of one, whatever. Uh, you can actually cross post that Foursquare update to Facebook and Twitter. So that's a nice little addition. Uh, you can see recent check-ins, tips, and photos, so you can see all the data that users are adding to the system about your business, and we've talked about photos in the past, so it might be a good idea to use the app as just an easy way to keep track of, oh, that's you know, a cool picture of my menu item, I'm going to promote that or put it on the page or highlight it in one way or another. Uh, you can do things like turn specials on and off. So if you are the type of company that's been using a lot of specials, maybe you want to say, hey, it's happy hour right now for the next hour. Uh, everybody who checks in on Foursquare gets a dollar off their drink. You can do that with just a simple on-off switch, which is kind of nice. You can have a bunch of specials queued up and then just say, all right, this one's active now, this one's off. And then finally, you can look at your business data. So you can look at check-ins over time, what popular times are for check-ins, that sort of thing. So you know, not nothing groundbreaking. They're not unlocking data that previously was unavailable. It's basically giving you easy access to all of the behind the scenes data that Foursquare made available already. But it's putting it on your mobile phone. Uh, it makes it easy to access if you're, you know, running around the store, you're doing a bunch of other things and you want to do things quickly, like turn specials on, like see, oh, the mayor just checked in, you know, I should go say hi, that sort of thing. So, I think if Foursquare is at all important to your business, throw this on your phone, open it up a couple times a week, and just see if it makes your life easier. Because my guess would be, number one, it will. And number two, they'll probably add additional features to it in the future. Things like push notifications when the mayor checks in, that sort of thing that could be really valuable to a brick-and-mortar retail store. And if it's not important, if Foursquare is not important to your business, then maybe you should check it out because this would help it be important to your business, I'd say, as well. 
All right, well, lots of great stuff this week and plenty more to think about as these stories unfold. But if you have any questions for us, if you'd like to suggest a topic, if you want to give feedback on this episode, or hey, even if you just want to say hi, we definitely encourage you to do that. This is a two-way street. We would love to get in contact with our listeners, just hear what you like about the show and what we can do to make the show better. Easiest way to get in touch with us is via Twitter. We are both reachable at Solomo Show. Or you can reach myself directly. I'm at Corey O'Brien. And I'm at Secret Sushi. You can also email us. We check that out as well at S O L O M O S H O W at gmail.com. That's Solomo Show at gmail.com. You can also check us out on our Facebook page where we also share things that we find in between shows and when we're going to be uh, broadcasting our live stream of the show and everything. So go check that out. Uh, just search for Solomo Show on Facebook as well as Google+. And we have a Pinterest account where we have boards of our shows on there uh, because I don't know if you knew that you could uh, pin YouTube videos on Pinterest as well. And so we have our shows, the YouTube version of our shows on there where you can go ahead, check them out, and repin them to your heart's delight. There we go. And if you're looking for easy links to those social channels that we just mentioned or all of the links that we discussed today, they can be found in the show notes. And these show notes are viewable at solomoshow.com or in your podcast player of choice. There should be an option to view show notes. We include both the links that we discussed as well as a lot of times supplementary links. So it's worth checking out, clicking through, diving deeper into these stories on your own because there's always a lot of information. You know, maybe check through, read the comments, see what other people are saying. It's really a great way to dive deeper into anything that uh, piqued your interest a little bit. Maybe you liked that Foursquare for Business app and you want to download that. We include all those links in the show notes. So definitely check those out at solomoshow.com. And with that, we will call this episode a wrap and hope you join us next week for another great episode of The Solo Mo Show. Take care. Take care.